And to me, estate planning is much more than documents. We're gonna talk about documents today, but you guys have, if you haven't already, you've experienced roadblocks because you didn't have the right thing in place, or maybe speed bumps because you didn't have the right document in place. Um, so that's one of the very important documents or topics for uh, caregivers. Um, as Rachel also mentioned, um, I moved to Missouri, um, it's been almost 35 years ago, I guess, um, in order to care for my grandma. She needed 24-hour care, and um, no one else in the family would move in and take care of her, so my parents uprooted us from California, moved us to Missouri to take care of her. Um, we took care of her for the last two years of her life. Um, from that time, my mom then went to a nursing home and um, worked as a housekeeper for 30 years. She's been there for 30 years still. And my dad spent the last 23 years of his working career as a janitor and maintenance in a nursing home. So I have grown up around the senior community. Um, and working in those jobs, they usually worked evenings, weekends, holidays and stuff, and daycare wasn't always available. So we went with them, uh, junior high and high school, we volunteered there to try to keep us out of trouble. Um, sorry, I say we because I have an identical twin, so I did so many things together with her. So, uh, so I have spent a lot of time around the senior community, and it was just kind of a natural thing for me to come back uh, whenever I graduated law school, to come back and work with the community that I grew up around and just have such a passion for. So I want to thank all of you for the work that you do. Um, caregiving is exhausting. Um, I've done some training as a certified dementia practitioner, and um, some of you may or may not know, for every day you spend caring for someone, you could lose up to four days off of your life if you're not taking care of yourself, because you know the, the stress of being a caregiver is great. So but let's talk about some of the things that proper prior estate planning prevents poor performance. I came up with the title not thinking about it, I had, I'd have to say it, so <laughs> uh, pardon me if I uh, mess it up any time in here. Um, but before we get started, let's talk about what an estate plan is. Um, a proper estate plan is one where you can control your property while you're alive and well, provide for yourself and your loved ones if you become disabled, when you die, give what you have to whom you want, the way you want, when you want, and minimize the impact of professional fees, court costs, and taxes. And um, when I say professional fees, they're attorney's fees, um, like myself and other attorneys out there. Um, a good attorney will help you make sure that you're not coming back to them and paying them more money than necessary uh, if your documents are prepared correctly. But the most important thing proper estate planning can do is bring you and your family peace of mind. Um, Having the right documents in place, having the right language in place really makes things a lot easier. And I'm sure some of you have already came across some issues um, in, in using your documents or not having documents. Who needs an estate plan? The answer is everyone age 18 and over. So that's single people, married people, young people, old people, people with children, people without children, people with lots of assets, people with no assets. As we go forward in this presentation, I'm gonna talk about different people and different times people needed documents, and you'll see why every one of these people need some sort of document in place. The most common thing we hear from people is, I don't have anything, I don't need any documents in place, I don't need an estate plan. It's not just about your assets, there's so much more to an estate plan. Another question we get a lot is, when should we plan? Now. While you can, before you can't. Um, that might be because you lose capacity or that might be because you pass away. So the best time to plan is now. I always tell my clients, you can always come back and change your documents it, while you have capacity. We like to do planning as if something were to happen tomorrow. But if you're dead or you don't have capacity, you can't make any sort of plan. So there's no time like the present. Some of the most popular documents in an estate plan I've got listed here. There are numerous plans, numerous documents needed, and it really varies on your situation. Um, you'll see here we have a HIPAA release, living well healthcare directive, medical power of attorney, financial power of attorney, last will and testament, and trust. And we're going to talk a little more in detail about each one of these documents. I always like to start with the easiest one first. 
um, whenever, especially when we're signing documents, the HIPAA release. You've all probably heard the word HIPAA, but not really sure what does it stand for. It stands for the Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act. I'll say that one five times fast. <laughs> Um, you probably have actually signed one of these documents yourself. I know whenever I go to the doctor every year I have to renew my HIPAA. Um, first of all, so they can bill insurance because they need to be able to share my medical condition in order to get paid. Uh, but also so that they can speak to my husband or whoever else I want them to be able to talk, talk to on my behalf. Um, these also usually are facility specific or provider specific. So while you might sign one with your doctor at St. Luke's, if you end up at research for some sort of procedure, those don't transfer over to other facilities. So it's important to have a generic HIPAA that allows your family members or loved ones or yourself as caregivers to be able to get the information that you need from the medical provider. The next document I wanna talk about is a medical directive or living will. Every state has different documents. Missouri actually has a really good li uh, living will and healthcare directive. It's more robust than Kansas. You'll find, um, I'm licensed in Missouri and Kansas, but I tend to favor Can or Missouri for a lot of things, especially football and basketball, go Mizzou. <laughs> uh, the first thing I wanna tell you though is a medical directive is not a DNR. A DNR is a document that stands for do not resuscitate. That means you have died and you do not want to be resuscitated. A DNR has to be signed by a physician and generally is facility specific. So an attorney is not going to be able to give you a valid DNR. What an attorney can help you with is designating if you want artificial food and hydration, <laughs> expressions of your wishes concerning your end of life conditions, and if you have a terminal condition or are unable to give direction, give some guidance. So in Missouri, the state approved form that has been approved um, basically says if you are in a terminal condition and you're unable to communicate with doctors, whether you are in a coma or have um, a brain injury or anything like that, if these things would prolong the dying process, you elect whether you want them or not. And I can tell you I've had to use these documents myself um, for a couple clients who became like family that I ended up taking care of at the end of their life. And I had to make decisions at the end of their life of what treatment to do. And while it was very difficult to make those decisions because it is emotional, I found peace in knowing I was doing exactly what they wanted me to. My husband's actually a hospice and palliative care physician. And so as I was going through this journey with the two of the clients that I dealt with this for, he reminded me as I, you know, as I struggled with, he reminded me those documents are there for a reason. You know, and I'm the person who usually tells you that, you know, so it was kind of the tables were turned and I got to experience that. But it really does promote family harmony, too, to have those documents in place because you don't have family arguing, even if you have a power of attorney, which we'll talk next. You don't have them arguing, say, that's not what mom would have wanted or why are you doing that? You, your loved one has made those decisions and made it easy for you to say, hey, this is the way that we, this is the way I want things to be done. Um, and so it really gives you guidance and peace of mind to know that whenever, what decisions you're making near the end of their life are the ones that they would have made if they could have communicated themselves. So to me, it's one of the most important documents. And I know my husband as a hospice and palliative care physician tells me all the time that people do not have these. They just don't think about them. They don't think they're important. And to me, they are one of the most important parts of your estate plan. Uh, the next document that I call it, we are part of our medical package, is a health care power of attorney. You all probably have heard of this document. Some attorneys will combine a health care with a financial. We really do not like to do that just because we like to name different people for different things sometimes. But this health care power of attorney authorizes the agent to make medical decisions whenever you're unable to. So if the loved one you're caring for cannot make medical decision, it allows you or whomever they want to make those medical decisions. Things like consent to surgery or procedure, admit or discharge for a hospital or nursing home, um, and giving guidance to clients whenever they're trying to decide what to do here. Um, I, I, I put to name here, one of the pieces of mind, I, or pieces of um, advice I always like to give is that you wanna pick someone who will make the decisions most like you or decisions that you would want made. So for example, I mentioned earlier, I have an identical twin. She is my best friend in the whole world. 
We are 43 years old, still look alike, not by trying. Um, she has children. I have chosen not to have children. Uh, her kids are mine. One of her kids actually opens my phone with facial recognition because she looks so much like me. <laughs> um, that being said, she's my alternate to my husband on my trustee, on my financial, all of those things. She is not my alternate to my husband on my medical because she could not do what I wanted. Neither could my mom or my daddy. My brother's 13 years in the army. He couldn't do it either because I don't want extraordinary measures. And I know them. I've talked with them. They couldn't do it. So I have a, a girlfriend from childhood who has a PhD in nursing. She is the alternate to my husband because she will make the decision I want. So it's very important when you're making those decisions to keep those things in mind, that this person is going to be, be making decisions and you want to make sure it's the decision that you would have wanted. Financial power of attorney. This is the document that authorizes your agent to make financial decisions for you. Uh, things like deal with your bank accounts, sell real estate, create trust, sometimes gift assets, manage government benefits. This document is one of the most important ones that people just do not realize that they need. And we'll talk about that here in just a second. But with this document, you can choose when it becomes effective. So 10, 15 years ago, we were doing these as attorneys and we were making them what we call springing, which meant they didn't become effective until you were incapacitated. We do not recommend that anymore for a couple of reasons. The first one is banks and institutions are not taking them if they're springing. The second one is springing meant you had to have one to two doctors write a letter that said you were incapacitated. And you know why doctors aren't writing those anymore? Liability. People sue. And unfortunately, one of the things I have to say every day, people don't always do the right thing. So if they sign that letter that says someone's incapacitated and that person uses that to enforce a power of attorney, financial power of attorney, and go do something bad, steal all mom's money, the doctors are being brought into the lawsuit because they wrote the letter that triggered that being um, available to them. So we now make them effective immediately. And I have a saying that I tell my clients all the time when they get kind of uneasy about it. If you don't trust that person to have access to your assets while you have capacity, you sure as heck shouldn't trust them to have access to your assets when you don't have capacity. Generally, I also tell people, put this document in a safe place and don't give it to them until they need it. Tell them where they can find it, but you don't have to give it to them until they need it. It's also really handy, though, for caregivers to have availability to take care of things while their loved one may have capacity, um, because sometimes it's cumbersome. Let's talk about the DMV. Who loves going to the DMV? <laughs> and this is the example I use often with them, you know, like, you know, if you need to go to the DMV to renew your tags, give this to your daughter, make her go stand there for four hours, you know, because it, it's true, you know, you can make those things easier on them by being able to take care of those things. Even if you do have a trust, which we'll talk about here a little later, you need a power of attorney for assets that aren't held in your trust. Things like retirement plans that can't be owned by a trust while you're alive. They're only in your name individually. You need to have a power of attorney so they can deal with that. With your social security, with your Medicare, all of those things that come under that umbrella. But one of the important things that people don't realize is a power of attorney dies when you die. I can't tell you how many times we get calls from people that says, I was mom's power of attorney on her bank account and the bank won't let me get the money. Like, well, what happened? Did mom pass away? Yep. Well, that's because that document died when mom died. So keep that in mind. That's why you don't just need a financial planning or a financial power of attorney. You've got to plan for those things that happen after too. A lot of times we do still get people who say, why do I need a power of attorney? I'm married. Can't my spouse take care of things for me? And the answer is no. Missouri is one of five states that medically is not a next of kin state. And what that means is most states, 45 states, have a law in the books that says if you don't have a document in place, next of kin statute comes into play. And it says these are the people who can make medical decisions for this person. Missouri does not have that document. You would be surprised when I give this same lecture to uh, ethics committees and physicians that they don't know this. Um, it's because, depending on where they did the residency, it wasn't an issue. But in Missouri, we're not an ex-of-kin state. They technically are not supposed to talk to your spouse or your loved one at all without a HIPAA release 
and you can't make medical decisions without a power of attorney. If you don't have this power of attorney when it comes to medical, you're looking at guardianship. And I know Rusty Fercasa with past elder law is gonna be talking later this afternoon about that. So if you have some questions about guardianship or power of attorneys and which is the right decision for you, he's gonna be talking on that and it's a great session uh, to get some more information. But also, what about joint owners? My daughter's on my bank account. Why do I need a power of attorney? First of all, we'll talk about why that's a bad idea later. But second, joint ownership isn't always possible on everything. Think about retirement plans. They can only be owned by the individual. So they can't be owned by someone else. A lot of times with the generations that are coming up now needing long-term care, they're no longer the pension generation, they're the ones who put into retirement. And they sometimes could have millions in their retirement and no funds anywhere else. And that's the money we're having to get to in order to make sure they get the care that they need. So that power of attorney is so important. And it's not just for the seniors, it's also for your own children. When they turn 18, you, leave, you lose the legal right to make any decision for them. You lose the legal right to call the doctor to make a doctor's appointment for them. My favorite one is, I'm paying for their college. Shouldn't I get to know what their grades are? Nope. So, if you have a child going to college, being the sandwich generation, a lot of you may be there, make sure you get those documents. Most of us attorneys that practice in this area offer a certain, what we call a college bound packet, and it just has the basics, HIPAA, medical power of attorney, and financial power of attorney, you know, just the basics so if something happens, you can take care of things. But also, if you have a child with special needs, again, there's gonna be a factor of determining whether you can do a power of attorney or whether you need conservatorship, that's gonna be for the financial part, so in Missouri, just so you know, every state's different. Missouri has guardianship, which is over the person. That's medical decisions and placement. Conservatorship in Missouri is financial. That's over the assets. Every state calls them different things. I know when the Britney Spears thing was going on, and I'm sure you all have heard about that being caregivers, it was conservatorship, conservator, conservatorship. But in California, conservatorship is everything. So it really depends. So just a little tip there for you guys. So the next document that I want to talk about is the last will and testament. This is probably the one everyone's heard of. If you haven't, you've been sleeping under a rock. So this is a document that gives written instructions to a court about how your property is to be divided upon your death. It also designates an executor, or in Missouri, we call it a personal representative. And it also, if you have minor children, can designate the guardian of your minor children. Most people do not realize this though, a will is for probate. A will trumps what the state law is. So if you don't have a will, the state has a plan for you and it's probably not the one you want. For example, if in Missouri, if you die tomorrow and you're married and you have an asset, it doesn't go all to your spouse. The law says half of it goes to your spouse and half of it goes to your children. There's some variables there, maybe depending if they're joint children or not. But for the most part, that's not what most people want. If they're married, they want everything to go to their spouse. And you can't expect, oh, my kids would give it back to my spouse. It's not always going to happen. As an elder law attorney, one of the things I have to tell people every day, there's three things I say every day, and every one of my gals in my office can tell you this. Number one is don't expect people to do the right thing. Number two, I'm sorry if anyone has... Uh, sensitive ears. I got a little bit of French me, but people are assholes. <laughs> you know it's true. And the third one, that's not mine. Who said it? The third one is don't trust the in-law. It's not your kids I'm worried about. It's their spouse. And a lot of times, as a daughter-in-law, I can say this, it's the daughter-in-law who's the trouble. So, I know, I'm sorry to call you all out, but it's the truth. And when I tell families these things, they're always like, you know what, you're right. <laughs> so a lot of times when we're doing family meetings with families, we don't allow in-laws in. We only allow the kids, the actual kids in, because it helps keep those issues out. So again, a will is not for probate. It just avoids the court's laws coming in and making the decisions, state laws coming in and making those decisions. It overrides the state defaults. So how do you avoid probate? Trust. We just <coughs> have to
All right, trust. And some of you have probably heard of this document. A trust is a relationship in which one person holds title to property subject to obligation to keep or use the property for the benefit of another. So that's like a fancy legal term, but what the heck does it actually mean? A trust is a vehicle, a lot like a business or like an entity, that can hold assets with specific instructions on how it is to be used. I want to talk about the most common types of trust uh, that we see. There are hundreds, if not thousands, of different types of trust and provision you can put in trust, but I want to talk about some of the basic ones that we have up here. Um, I'm going to start with the testamentary trust. A testamentary trust, or testamentary trust, depending on how you want to say it, is a trust that is created via your will. This is a trust that does not come into being until you pass away, and it has to go through probate. This often is a trust that we will use for young couples or people who are life insurance rich but don't really have any other assets. It's a way to make sure that the assets don't get locked up in conservatorship with court for minor children or someone with um, special needs, but it's also a way to, to minimize the cost of a full-blown trust estate plan. So we see this sometimes, like I said, we will use it with clients who are life insurance rich where this asset doesn't exist until they pass away. But it is an option to use. Um, the only thing about it is it is very costly to administer because it has to go through the probate process. But it is better than not having anything. The second type and probably the most common type of trust is a revocable trust. You'll sometimes see this called a living trust or a revocable living trust or a family living trust or every attorney has their own name for it, their own product that they, they have. This is generally what we call a probate avoidance trust. I love using trust in planning because I do do probate work, um, but people die, trust don't. And if you don't plan properly, your assets can end up in probate. So many times we have clients tell us, I've got my beneficiary designations. I'm, my kids are named on all of my accounts, I'm good. Tiffany can tell you we are still working on a uh, case right now, a very sad case. Mom and three of her four adult children were in a vehicle. They were hit by a semi-truck on a way to a family's wedding. Three of the four children died. Mom and three of the kids died. Never would have expected that. They were adult children. And it is a probate nightmare. Because, yeah, she had the kids on the asset, but guess what? They didn't survive her. So they have minor children. We are now locked up in court with litigation and setting up conservatorships and all sorts of stuff. So people die, trust don't. You don't want to think about it, but it happens. We had a client just come in this week and Tiffany told me about, um, she's like, I've got 11 kids. And she's like, and three of them have passed away. And Tiffany's like, well, yeah, you definitely need to update. I'm really sorry to hear that. She's like, that's okay, I still got eight more. <laughs> you know, it comes down to it. And you guys know as caregivers, if you don't laugh about it, you're gonna cry about it. So you'll find that most of us that do this kind of work, we've got some dark humor and some jokes that you're like, ooh, you can tell like in this kind of room or with those you know, people who do that, but other people will be like, oh, wow. If you don't laugh about it, you're gonna cry about it. Uh, a few more things about this revocable trust. The owner retains control of those assets while they're alive in half capacity. They can appoint a co-trustee, similar to financial power of attorney, they can appoint a co-trustee for someone to help them manage those things while they're alive if they want. As the name suggests, revocable, they are able to change or amend it. It is private. There is no court involvement in Missouri. Every state's different. It can provide protection for beneficiaries. And this is one of the key reasons why I like, why I love using trust. Um, it can provide protection for creditors. So that would be, um, you know, if you have someone who has a bankruptcy or someone who has a judgment against them. And we've had this happen before. Someone had just had a will and the person had just filed bankruptcy. All that money that could have helped get them set up for the future and a fresh start went to bankruptcy and went to pass that. So they didn't even get to use that to get a fresh start because they didn't have a trust in place. Um, another way that they can do it is divorce. Unfortunately, at least 50% of marriages end in divorce. And if someone gets divorced and the assets aren't properly titled, those assets or half of those assets could be lost in a divorce. It also can protect beneficiaries from themselves. Uh, we do this with distrib distribution provisions. 
So for example, sometimes we call it HIMSS, that's Health, Education, Maintenance, and Support. And especially when you've got minor children, or we usually like children under 25, um, that it will pay for college if they need uh, to pay for college. Um, health could be braces or a lung transplant. Education, like I said, could be college. It could also be you know, their senior class trip or dance classes. If you have kids in any of those things, gymnastics or dance classes or uh, competitive baseball or football, that stuff is expensive. Um, and having a trust with some money there to be able to pay for those things is nice. Another thing sometimes we can do with these trusts is make them age banded, which means money all stays in trust and they get it out right at 25. Uh, sometimes it's 30, sometimes it's 35. When people want to go beyond 35, I usually say let's do something else because in my opinion, if people don't have their crap together by 25, it's probably not ever going to happen. You know, I mean, it's the truth. Um, sometimes we can stretch them out over years. So if you know you've got that kid that oh, they're not great with money, okay, great. Let's say, let's put it in here for 20 years, they get 5% a year. When that 5% is gone, they got to wait till next year to get their next round. Might help them learn to stretch that out. Um, and then another way is incentive trust. Uh, incentive trust are trust where you try to incentivize that person to do what you want them to do. Uh, so for example, I have a client who um, has built, they, they inherited one storage shed um, and then got into the storage or storage shed business. They got into it, they now have built a 20 plus million dollar business with this. Well, their son feels entitled um, and thinks that's his money. Have you guys ever seen Shaq? on, um, I think it was on the Harvey show, where he says, my, my son said we're rich, and I said to him, you're not rich, I'm rich. <laughs> this kid's like that, he thinks he's rich. So what we've done, and he thinks he doesn't need to work because when mom and dad die, I'm gonna have all this money. So we set that trust up so that he gets, for every dollar he earns through his work, he gets a dollar out of the trust. So things like that. Trust attorneys can get creative with incentivizing the behavior you want. And one of them that's near and dear to my heart is substance abuse. Um, I unfortunately have a sister who has a drug problem. Um, she was sober for seven years and uh, decided to start using again. Unfortunately, her uh, husband passed away of an overdose in February this year uh, at 31 years old. Um, but um, that has made her decide to get sober again. And we're hoping it sticks. But any of you that have a loved one with substance abuse knows it can be a roller coaster. And so having substance abuse provisions in there. Um, with, with Samantha, we're not always sure. You know, she tells you one thing, you don't know if she's really sober. With the trust provisions we put in, we can say, all right, you've got to take a drug test before you get any money out of here. But it can also be used to benefit them. You know what, we're going to pay for you to go to rehab. We're going to pay for you to live in a community that we know isn't filled with drug users that are just going to push you back into that lifestyle. So again, this is, these are ways to protect them from themselves. Another type of trust are irrevocable trust. These are the type that generally cannot be amended by the grantor, as the name suggests. They're typically used for Medicaid planning, uh, veterans benefits, asset protection planning, and sometimes federal estate tax planning. Sometimes they do offer creditor protection, but these are powerful trusts that can protect your assets for one or both spouses if someone needs to go to a long-term care. Um, I've personally done this for my mom and dad. I mentioned them earlier. Um, they're still young, mom is 63, daddy is 68. Um, they, though, do not have really any money in savings. They've worked blue collar jobs their whole life, but they are land rich, cash poor, which we have a lot of that, especially in this area, in the more rural area. Um, the land that they have is land that's been in their family for generations, and we want to make sure to protect that if one or both of them have to go to a nursing home. So we've put it into what we call a Medicaid Asset Protection Trust. And as long as it's in there for five years, if they go to a nursing home, that is not gonna be needed in order to, or taken by the state in order to pay for their care. So it gives peace of mind to my parents to know that if something happens and they do have to go to a nursing home, I know everyone wants to say, I'm never going, I'm never letting my loved one go, but it's not always your decision. Um, but it's a great way to make sure you've protected those assets for that person and for your family, for your generation. Um, the last type of trust I want to talk about is a special needs trust. This is a trust that is established for the benefit of a person who has a disability. 
It allows them to receive an inheritance, or sometimes we use these for judgments or awards that they get in lawsuits, um, without disqualifying them from their government benefits. So a lot of times the benefits we're referring to might be SSI, um, it may be Medicaid, it may be Section 8 housing or something else that is needs-based where they do a test of what your assets are. So these tests are, these type of trusts are really important to be able to protect them and allow them to be able to do what they need and buy things that Medicaid or SSI can't. I believe the current amount for SSI is around 950 or so a month. 914, thank you. That's not much. I mean, I can spend that in one weekend going out to nice dinners and having a couple bottles of wine, you know? Um, but we can use these trusts to be able to allow them to go on family vacations. So say the parents have passed away and the brother's going to Disney World, and we know that's an expensive trip. It's not gonna be a financial burden to the family because they can just take money out of the trust, his special needs trust to pay for him to go. It can pay for specialized medical equipment that Medicaid won't pay for. And in one case, we have a client who has a grandson who had, has autism among, among other diseases and illnesses, um, and he is particular about a certain type of diaper he will wear. The other ones he will take off. Medicaid won't pay for them. So those things get expensive, and having this trust to supplement those benefits is great because it allows them to have a lifestyle and still keep their benefits. The last thing I want to talk about are a couple tips for proper planning. And I know we're a couple minutes over, but we started late. Is that okay? Okay. Yeah. All right. Go ahead. I want to make sure. So some of the best tips. First of all, have a plan. Two-thirds of Americans do not have plans. And you might think, oh, that's the young people. No. Young people are getting their affairs in order because they see the stuff that their grandparents or parents are going through. It is the sandwich generation and the people they're caring for that don't have their estate plans. So get a plan. Update your plan. We generally say update it every three to five years, at least have it reviewed with your attorney. But if there is a death, divorce, diagnosis, or decline of anyone named in your documents, which includes yourself, your spouse if you have one, or anyone you've named, you want to talk with an attorney and make sure those are updated and that you can protect that person and yourself. Don't DIY. There are a lot of things that are fine to DIY. Change your oil. Re renovate your bathroom. I don't know if I do that, but you know, go for it. The costs are exponentially more for you to do a Susie Orman form or a Office Depot form, get it wrong, then come to an attorney for help because it's exponentially more for us to fix it than to do it right the first time. Um, don't name minors as beneficiaries. This is something we see all the time. Well, I want my kids to get my assets whenever I pass away. If you do that, you pass away while they're under 18, most likely it's gonna end up in what we call a conservatorship with court. And that requires an attorney. And I know I'm tracking trash on some of those attorneys, but we cost money. We went to school for a long time and we cost money for our time and our knowledge. So you've got to pay for that. And every time you want to pay for a bill, you need money out of that out of that conservatorship account, you've got to hire your attorney to go back to court to get a court order in order to spend it. And without that document, um, without properly planning, we sometimes find we will spend more on attorney fees to go back to court than the item we're actually trying to purchase. So don't leave money to minor beneficiaries. But don't also do this next one. Name the guardian as the beneficiary. I know you mean well. Remember those three things I talked about first. People don't always do the right thing. People are assholes and don't trust the in-law. But if that person you've named gets divorced, their spouse can take half of it. If they have debt or creditor issues or anything like that, that's their asset. It's gone. It's not used for your kids. If they die, it becomes part of their estate, and you don't have control over what they do with it. And one that we worry about more in this area is if they need to go to a nursing home, that's an available asset that they have to spend to pay for their care. And that is not how you intended it. So here, again, is where a trust would be the best way to handle it. We kind of talked about this one already. Don't leave assets to a person with special needs. Um, Well-intentioned, well-intending parents, grandparents often do this and it just causes problems. 
Don't put your kids' names on your property. And I know I mentioned this earlier and I see it all the time. Remember those three things I said, the things that can happen, they can get divorced and your house is the biggest one. If you put your kid on your house and your child gets divorced and they're on your title of your house, guess what? That's a marital asset. Their spouse can try to take that house or a part of it, or you've got to come up with the cash to buy them out of that house and you don't have it. So now you're homeless. You got to sell it and now you're homeless. Um, another reason, again, if they have debt, if they get a judgment against them, that lien tax liens, they search the property records, property rolls, and put liens on everything their name's on. So you need to sell that to pay for your long-term care. You're going to lose a lot of it to whatever their debt is, whatever the lien is. Another one, they can use it. I know you trust your child. I know you think they'd never do anything like that, but they can. And sometimes they do. And lastly on this one, um, it can disqualify you, them from Medicaid. So, or you from Medicaid. I'm going to be talking about that more in the next session. Um, and lastly, this one is a controversial one, but I think almost any elder law attorney that's been practicing for even a few years will tell you, don't name co-agents. One of the biggest reasons is banks are not taking it anymore. A lot of times you might say, okay, I'm going to name them both, but either one of them can act individually. The banks that are taking it are saying, nope, we, we just aren't even going to do it. We want both of them here. They both have to sign, even though you've said that. The courts actually in Jackson County and a lot of the courts across Missouri are now saying, we're not naming co-executors, co-personal representatives, co-guardians, co-conservatives, because if they disagree, we end up in court. And in Jackson County, what they're doing here is, you guys disagree, we're in court, we're according the public administrator, I guess the courthouse is that way. Public administrator, do any of you guys know anything about public administrator? Yeah, they don't know you either. They don't know your family either. And they're gonna be making decisions for them. They're gonna place them in a nursing home that I've been to that is pretty crappy because it's close and convenient for them. Not checking out if, they, if a family home would be better. They're going to spend the money the way they want to spend it. They're going to take their share of money too. So naming co-agents, again, parents are trying to be fair. They want to be equal to their kids. And there's a couple of things I always have to say that sound a little cold-hearted. First of all, if you're naming co-agents and you die, you're dead. <laughs> your kids, you're not going to be there to mediate. If you name one of your kids and the other ones are mad, you're dead. What are they going to do? You know, and we all know, at least in my family, we never speak ill of the dead. Um, the other thing, the problem that you have when you name co-agents, like I said, is you sometimes you don't just get the kids involved, you get that in-law. That causes problems too. Generally, what I like to say is your kids, hopefully, if they get along already, are going to communicate with each other. They're going to discuss. They're going to hopefully come to an agreement. They're not going to leave the other kids out. It's work. You guys know this, caregiving is work. Being a power of attorney, whether it's for medical or financial, is work. You're not doing them a favor by appointing them. My favorite story I'll end on is one of my clients, we were trying to decide who to name as her medical power of attorney, and she decided her daughter-in-law. And I said, okay, why did you choose your daughter-in-law? She hates me, she'll pull the plug before I can even get my last breath out. I'm like, okay. Those are the kind of things you want to take into account whenever you're making those decisions. My time is up. I want to thank you all very much for your time and patience listening today. Again, I will be speaking a little bit later on, uh, actually, this next session on Medicaid if you want to know more on that. My contact information is on here if you ever want to shoot me an email or give me a call. Um, I'm happy to. I love educating people. I love making sure people have the knowledge they need to have. Uh, one of the things I know coming from um, a very, I, I'm a first generation high school graduate. So I come from a very poor family. I know it's expensive to be poor. It's expensive not to have the knowledge and the resources to know how to do better. And I love promoting that for people. So thank you very much.